Right, hello everyone. Welcome to the SOFI seminar series. So today it is our great pleasure to have Professor Jali from Singapore Management University to present a new paper on volatility. We will have Frank Bibo from UPenn to discuss his paper. All right, let's get started. Okay. So let me share my screen. So can you see that okay? Yes. So let me try to move this. Is it moving? Yes. So everything is good. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks uh, the organizers for uh, giving me this uh, great opportunity for presenting our paper and thank Frank for discussing the paper and thank everyone uh, for uh, joining the events. So uh, today I'm going to talk about, you know, this paper, reading the candlesticks and OK estimator for volatility. So we are going to propose uh, a new estimator for spot volatility. And I'm Jali from Singapore Management University. And this is a joint work with Dishan Wang uh, from Derivatives China Capital uh, and Qiu Shi Zhang uh, from UIBE. Uh, uh, so uh, a little bit overview of what we are doing in this paper. So in this paper, we are going to consider a, a, a very standard continuous time model uh, for price. So, so the price model is given by this drift component and the jump component inside here is our you know, object of interest. So that is the stochastic integral for the stoch uh, stochastic volatility with respect to uh, a Brownian motion. Here W is our notation for the standard you know, Brownian motion. So the paper is about you know, estimating, uh, non-parametric estimating and conducting inference for spot volatility at a given time point. So for example, one may be interested in uh, this time, say 2.15 in the afternoon. So you know, one reason maybe uh, there's a FOM, FOMC announcement at that time and you are interested in the volatility level uh, around you know, the announcement time. So um, uh, to do that, uh, in this paper, we are going to work with uh, the, the high frequency uh, intraday candlestick data. And we are going to consider a uh, symptotic theory uh, in which you know, the sampling frequency is going to be higher and higher, or equivalently, the sampling interval becoming uh, shorter and shorter asymptotically. So just to, to be more precise, uh, let's imagine that we actually want to estimate volatility at this time point. And in that case, we may consider a short you know, trading session uh, from 2.15 to 2, uh, 220, for example. So in this, in this case, the length of uh, the trading session that we are considering is five minutes. And let's denote that by delta n. And asymptotically, we are sort of imagining a thought experiment in which delta n is going to zero. And hence, we have this standard you know, infield asymptotic uh, kind of a framework. So the candlestick, and of course, is a, like an old concept, you know, uh, invented by you know Japanese rice traders uh, from you know centuries ago. So the candlestick is basically uh, you know a combination of the open, close, and high and the low prices. So the open, close prices are the prices at these two time points, and the high and the lows are you know the highest and lowest prices uh, during uh, this trading session. So obviously, you know, the open and the close are going to give us return information and the high and low are going to give us, you know, range related information. So in this paper, we are going to consider, you know, the whole candlestick. So of course, in the high frequency literature, we have a lot of papers, you know, working with high frequency returns to talk about all kinds of interesting things. And there's also some work, you know, based on range, uh, high frequency range related data. So in this paper, we just consider everything together. So in this talk, uh, I'm mainly going to you know, focus on the case uh, in which we work with a single uh, candlestick. So once we understand how to work with a single candlestick and it's econometrically essentially trivial to extend the, the framework to the case in which we average a few uh, candlesticks. So hopefully, you know, by doing that, one may further improve the efficiency of our, of our estimator. But in the talk, I would just mainly focus on the single candlestick case. 
So we are going to use this kind of data to number metric estimate, estimate the spot volatility. And we do so with a well-defined sense of optimality. And we also are going to you know, propose a valid inference procedure. So because of this optimality claim and the fact that we are using a candlestick, we call this estimator the optimal candlestick estimator. So hence, you know, so we, we just call that for short, the OK estimator for volatility, which explains the title uh, of, this, of, of this paper. So now let me directly tell you, you know, how to convert a high frequency candlestick into our OK estimator for volatility. So this is our candlestick. So as I mentioned, it consists of you know, the open price, close price, high price, and low price. And if the price is dropping during the trading session, you know, we represent that with one color. So if the price is increasing, you know, we denote that with the other color. So if you open you know, your favorite trading app, say for example, Robinhood or whatever, or Bloomberg, uh, you can see you know, these kind of candlestick charts uh, on your screen. So those kind of data are readily available you know, at all kinds of frequencies. So, I mean, if we put all these candlesticks in a you know, real life chart, so here is a candlestick chart for SPY, which is the S&P 500 ETF, you are going to see something like this. So now let's suppose that I'm interested in estimating the spot volatility for a particular time point. And our estimator, well, let's just take the candlestick around that time point, so which may be considered as a nearest neighbor estimator, right, for volatility. So in this case, by working with this particular candlestick, uh, we are going to form this very simple estimator, which is actually our OK estimator for the spot volatility. So the estimator is simply defined as a linear combination of the range, namely high minus low, and uh, the absolute return, namely the absolute value of the, you know, the open close return. And you know, with some weights. And these weights are determined so by, from our theory in an optimal way, you know, uh, such that you know, the estimator uh, is asymptotically unbiased with you know, uh, minimum variance, essentially. So of course, you know, this is you know, high frequency estimator. We also need to normalize that by the square root of the duration of the trading session. So for example, five minutes. So more generally, so this, is, this estimator is our nearest neighbor estimator based on a single candlestick. So more generally, when we consider you know, averaging uh, K candlesticks uh, around this time, so in, in that case, one may call you know, this estimator, the average estimator, a K nearest neighbor estimator. But as I mentioned in this talk, I will just mainly focusing, just to cl clarify our main idea, I will, uh, I will just mainly focusing on the single candlestick estimator. So as I also mentioned, you know, uh, we are going to claim a particular sense of optimality. And you know, more precisely, the optimality concept is asymptotically unbiased and uh, with minimal variance within a class of linear estimators. And we are also going to propose a, a feasible inference procedure based on this estimator. Um, so obviously, uh, because we are working with just one you know, observation, one kind of thing observation, so when we do feasible inference, we cannot rely on you know, the traditional central limit theorem. So in particular, our inference is not going to be based on you know, the, the you know, central limit theorem based uh, asymptotic Gaussian argument. So instead, uh, we are going to use a coupling result uh, or a strong approximation result, uh, which is going to give us a non-Gaussian and fairly non-standard limiting distribution. And we are going to use that to conduct phys uh, feasible inference. So this is kind of one of the novelty uh, of, of our approach. And uh, you will see that you know, more clearly later, maybe we go to theory. So now let me try to you know, position our paper, our OK estimator uh, within the broader you know, literature. 
So obviously, you know, our, our paper belongs to the large literature on the number metric inference for spot volatility estimation. So because we are using candlesticks, you know, the paper is also belongs to, you know, the literature related to candlesticks. So of course, our paper is not the first to, you know, far away from the first for leveraging, you know, on the rich information from candlesticks. So there are some classical work in this literature. So one beautiful paper uh, is, you know, the, the paper by Garman class, and uh, they proposed an optimal, so in certain sense, an optimal estimator for the variance. Uh, but, you know, our uh, analysis is very different from that classical work because, you know, in that classical paper, Garman and class are considering, are considering a, a parametric model, in which case, in, uh, so, you know, with constant volatility, so in fact, they consider you know, a parametric model for the price in which the log price is modeled as a constant volatility times the, the Brown standard Brown motion. So in contrast, we focus on you know, a non-parametric setting, so which is standard in a high frequency world. And more than that, we are not only considering estimation problem, but importantly, we also have a, you know, a inference component. In particular, we are going to construct you know, um, sort of confidence intervals, value confidence intervals uh, for our estimator. As I mentioned, it's going to be based on coupling a related, you know, non-standard, non-Gaussian uh, distribution. And this is sort of the main distinction between our work and existing work uh, in the candlestick uh, world. So of course, in the background, you know, we also have a huge literature in high frequency econometrics, which, which talks about uh, the inference uh, estimation and inference for the integrated variance. So namely, we take the stochastic volatility process and integrate, uh, integrate that over a non-trivial uh, interval. So our uh, paper mainly focused on, you know, the spot volatility estimation for volatility at a given point. So which does not directly connect to uh, uh, this uh, literature, but there's an indirect connection because we know that there's an overlap between spot volatility and integrate volatility functional. So in particular, when we talk about, you know, the semi-parametric efficient estimation of general integrated, uh, integrated volatility functionals, namely functionals uh, like this, um, the current approach for that is basically tried, I mean, it's a two-step approach. In the first step, you know, one has to estimate non-parametrically the volatility and then plug that into the, the volatility function so as to get, you know, semi-parametric efficient estimator for these kind of functionals. So through that channel, um, maybe our OK estimator, so more efficient OK estimator for spot volatility will have, uh, you, know, you know, in future research, will have, a, you know, uh, some implication, indirect implication on how to improve the efficiency bound for these kind of functionals. So that is how our paper, you know, fits in, you know, all kinds of, you know, high frequency related uh, literatures. So, I mean, this is a more, you know, uh, precise, but far away from, you know, a still very complete uh, list of literatures uh, related to, you know, candlesticks, spot volatility, realized variance, and integra integrated volatility functionals. And of course, in the paper, we cite, you know, what is reference and, uh, and more. So now uh, let me jump to the theory. So uh, here is our model, right? Uh, the model for the price process or more precisely the log price process uh, is very standard. Uh, we are considering uh, Ito semi martingale model. So the price is you know, given by this. So we have the initial value, a, a drift component, a continuous martingale component and some jump component. So here, you know, sigma is our stochastic volatility process and W is a standard Brownian motion. So in our work, uh, the drift and the, and the jumps are going to be nuisance. So uh, asymptotically, uh, we are going to show that they have a negligible effect and our focus is on uh, the volatility. So these are the assumptions, basically all the assumptions that we are going to impose uh, in this paper. So which is arguably uh, standard for spot volatility estimation. So let me just briefly comment on assumption. 
So basically up to, you know, a local, you know, localizing sequence of stopping times, we have this kind of, you know, locally bounded uh, assumption for the relevant uh, processes, which is fairly standard. And the second condition here basically set, set, uh, says that, you know, the volatility process uh, in some way have some smoothness. To be more precise, this condition basically say, uh, says that, you know, under the L2 norm, the volatility process is kappa holder continuous, where kappa, you know, the, the holder, you know, continuity index uh, is, you know, a fixed number, but it can be arbitrarily small. So this uh, notion of smoothness allows for volatility jumps because the continuity requirement is only under the L2 norm instead of, you know, in a pathwise sense. So in particular, this is going to allow for the standard, you know, Ito semi martingale type of volatility or jump diffusion type of uh, volatility dynamics, in which case the kappa, you know, number is going to be one half. So it also is going to, you know, accommodate long memory type of volatility dynamics, in which case, you know, kappa is going to be greater than one half and, you know, as a matter of fact, we also can allow for the so-called, you know, rough volatility models, which is going to correspond to, you know, kappa being less than one half. So basically uh, for, you know, our analysis, we don't care about, you know, uh, how, you know, volatility will be, it was semi or long memory or rough models, because we can accommodate all, you know, kinds of volatility dynamics in this particular paper. So, now, let me tell you, you know, the class of estimators that we are interested in. So actually, we have already mentioned this. Um, uh, we are, in this paper, we are going to focus on uh, a very simple class of estimators, uh, with namely a linear class of estimators, uh, formed as a linear combination of um, the absolute return and the range. So if we look at the picture, right, the absolute return is basically the size of this box, the close and you know open and close, and you know the range is basically the total size of this candlestick, and and of uh, we also need to normalize this by the square root of the sampling interval. So um, you know of course one could consider more complicated class, but we are you know in this paper we are uh, just going to consider you know this simple class because it's very easy to analyze and very easy to implement. Um, so the lambda weights, so you know, we, we may consider different ways, uh, namely lambda one and lambda two, and eventually we are going to decide you know, this weight in an optimal way um, uh, to satisfy uh, two requirements, so namely asymptotic unbiasedness and minimum variance. So one may uh, so to ask the following question, namely, so is there any loss of a generality just to focus on two particular features, namely, you know, the absolute return and the range from this candlestick. So this is a relevant question because if you look at a candlestick, there are actually three scale relevant uh, features. So one is the size of the upper shadow, so this part. The second is the absolute return, the size of the real box, uh, real body. And third is the size of the lower shadow. So one could consider a more general, you know, three-feature linear estimator. But it turns out that there underlying there's a sufficiency argument, namely uh, by symmetry, it turns out that uh, the upper and the lower shadows, you know, at optimality are going to receive exactly the same optimal ways, which means that they can be bundled together into one feature. So at the end, so which means uh, without, without loss of generality, if we just focus on uh, optimal estimation, without loss, of, uh, without loss of generality, we can just focus on you know, these two features, namely the absolute return and the range, because they are, you know, is the, so they are basically, they are the sufficient statistic uh, with respect to this class of estimators. So, I mean, in, in order to talk about, you know, asymptotic optimality and also feasible inference, obviously, we need to derive the asymptotic properties for this class of estimators. And because you know, this estimator is based on a single observation, we cannot use central limit theorem to do that. 
So now the problem, econometric problem uh, in hand is how to uh, think about asymptotics for a fixed number of high frequency observations. So in particular, in our case, we are the fixed number is one. More generally, we can consider you know, five, 10, so on and so forth. And the idea is a coupling idea, and which is formalized by the following theorem. So the theorem, you know, under the maintained assumption that we introduced before, the theorem says that the spot estimator divided by the true thing can be represented in two components. So this is equality. So the first component is the leading component, and the second component is asymptotically negligible, and which absorbs all kinds of bias from uh, drift and jumps and the time variation in the volatility process. So the leading term uh, is given by this, which is related to, um, which we call the coupling variable also, which is related to the ways in, uh, in the linear estimator and certain functionals of the underlying Brownian motion. So why this is useful? So this is useful because it turns out, which is actually very easy to see that the coupling variable, this guy, is asymptotically pivotal, meaning that the distribution of the coupling variable uh, C for any lambda weight uh, is known exactly in finite sample. And to see that more clearly, let me introduce a generic you know, copy of a standard Brownian motion on the unit time interval B. So, and you know, by the scaling property of the Brownian motion, it's very easy to see that the C variable is in distribution identical to the following you know, Brownian functional, which is related to the weights and you know, absolute value of the end value of the Brownian motion at time one, and the, the range of the Brownian motion over the unit interval. So, um, and because of, you know, because this guy, you know, obviously, you know, this is non-standard distribution, but it's known in finite sample, it's nuisance parameter free. So, and this eventually is going to allow us to talk about feasible inference. So in particular, you know, for, you know, the, or the, you know, high frequency uh, econometricians in the audience. And this is interesting because, I mean, this allows us to, to conduct, you know, uh, feasible inference without the need to derive the mysterious stable convergence, uh, convergence in law. So and this idea has also been used in our, some of my previous papers, the coupling idea. So we, in which we also talk about how to use top different coupling ideas uh, to conduct a uh, feasible inference for spot volatility. Okay. So given this you know, uh, coupling result, we can now more formally talk uh, more formally talk about you know uh, the optimal choice of the weights. So this is about optimality. So uh, uh, a trivial consequence of the coupling result is the following convergence in distribution. So as a you know a corollary of uh, the previous result, we can show that, and it's actually very easy to see that. Uh, the multiplicative estimation error is going to converge in distribution to this limiting distribution. So which is you know, this particular Brownian functional. And then um, for, the, for choosing the weight lambda optimally, it, and so that question is about how to choose lambda to minimize in some you know, probabilistic way uh, this estimation error. So there are many ways uh, to think about that question, but a particularly so reasonable way to do that uh, is the following. So maybe we can you know, impose unbiasedness, asymptotic unbiasedness on the limiting variable, and at the same time, try to minimize the asymptotic variance. So this is not the only way to talk about optimality, but it, I, so we believe this is a reasonable way. So if we want to seek this kind of, you know, this notion of optimality, uh, what we need to do is to minimize the variance of the limiting variable subject to this you know, unbiasedness uh, restriction. And this amounts to solve a quadratic you know, optimization problem, which is very easy. And the solution uh, for the lambda vase, optimal vase, are basically these numbers. 
And this is why, you know, at the very beginning, we proposed this uh, linear estimator with these particular weights uh, as a, you know, uh, combining, you know, the range and the absolute return. And from here, we now see that, you know, the more precise interpretation of the optimality uh, component for our OK estimator is a symptotic minimum variance unbiasedness. Uh, you know, in the numerical uh, in the numerical experiment, we can show that you know, we see that you know the efficient gain for using this estimator relative to the estimator based only on the return is is actually pretty large. It's seven times uh, uh, efficiency improvement. Okay, so uh, this is uh, you know about optimality. So one particularly interesting observation from this optimal solution is that the weight in front of the absolute return is actually negative. So meaning that, you know, other things being equal. So if we fix uh, the size of the range, uh, this suggests that, you know, when the absolute return is large, the volatility estimate is actually small and vice versa. And this observation is particularly relevant for you know, a very uh, interesting uh, pattern in the candlestick, which is called the doji pattern. So doji is a Japanese word, which means in Japanese means you know, in the current setting, it's a mistake. Uh, in, and in technical, a technical analysis, a doji candlestick refers to the following pattern. So, you know, uh, there are two, you know, criterions. Uh, one is that uh, the absolute return should be small, and at the same time, the range should be large. So to give you a real, you know, a real, re real life example of, of a doji uh, candlestick. So this is a doji, uh, in which case you can see, you know, the, the box is very small. So the absolute return is very small. But meanwhile, the, the whole, you know, the candlestick itself is not small. And here we have the other example of doji. So, so for these kind of patterns, right, we're not trying to, you know, predict returns, but, you know, for the sake of, you know, estimating volatility, this uh, kind of pattern is interesting because if we only look at, you know, the small abs absolute value of the doji and you know, candlestick, one may think the volatility is low. You know, simply because the absolute return is, you know, is, uh, is small. But, you know, given the same range from the optimal, you know, estimator, we know that a smaller ab absolute return actually implies, you know, higher volatility. So this suggests that, you know, looking at the whole candlestick may be uh, helpful uh, for avoid, you know, the doji mistake. So here we uh, um, underestimate uh, the level of volatility, but by, by, by just looking at a small absolute, uh, absolute return. So um, it turns out uh, that uh, the theory that we have developed for our linear estimator, our OK you know, linear estimator, can be easily extended to other kinds of candlestick-based estimators. Of course, one important example is the garment class estimator. So basically, uh, using our theory, uh, we can give uh, a high frequency interpretation for the classical gamma class estimator. So I mean, just to recall, you know what gamma and class uh, gamma and class did in their original paper, uh, they considered the optimal estimation of variance for this parametric model. In which case, the log price is modeled as a constant volatility times a Brownian motion. So, uh, you know, we, we may de develop a similar coupling theory for their estimator. Just to fix idea, let's consider the practical version of the garment class estimator, which is given for spot, spot variance, which is given uh, in this way, uh, defined as a linear combination of the squared ret uh, range and the squared return uh, and properly uh, normalized. So we can sort of derive a similar coupling result for this estimator as well, uh, where the coupling variable is going to have this shape. I mean, the limiting you know, variable is going to have, is going to look like uh, this you know, Brownian functional. 
So by using a very similar argument like before, uh, this coupling result uh, for the high frequency gamma class estimator is going to imply that the gamma class estimator when applied for high frequency data is also an okay estimator, namely asymptotically uh, unbiased with minimum variance uh, for the spot variance, uh, for the spot variance. So meanwhile, we are considering the okay estimation for spot volatility, but this version of the gamma class estimator is going to be an open, uh, sort of an okay estimator for the spot variance. So we can also you know, do that for many different, many other kinds of estimators um, by using the same you know, coupling theory. So now, uh, so that is the end of our, our discussion for, the, uh, for optimality. Now let's talk about you know, how to conduct feasible inference for the spot volatility. So basically we are going to use the same you know, asymptotic distribution. So just to recall our previous result, uh, where we showed that the multiplicative estimation error is going to converge in distribution uh, to this particular running functional. So now we are just focusing on the optimal estimator determined by the optimal you know, lambda star of the optimal weight. So um, uh, to conduct, feasible, uh, to conduct you know, feasible inference, let's, consi let's consider a constant interval you know, L and U. And by continuous mapping theorem, uh, you know, applied to this convergence, you know, uh, for this particular, you know, transformation, uh, we see that we also have the same, you know, a distribution of approximation for the reciprocal uh, of this, uh, you know, estimation error. So because of that, the probability that, you know, the estimation error, you know, belongs to this interval is going to be approximately the same as the probability that the limiting variable belongs to this uh, interval. Uh, because we know the exact you know, final sample distribution of this limiting variable, we can choose the constant L and U such that the coverage probability is exactly 90%, for example, which is a confidence level. Of course, it can be other numbers. You know, 90 is just my favorite number in this paper. And because of this result, uh, we see that you know, from here, uh, the L and the constant interval scaled by our you know, estimator is going to be a valid you know, um, uh, confidence interval for the spot volatility. And the remaining question is to how to choose L and U. So one way to optimize this is to try to minimize the length of this confidence interval to minimize you know, the distance between L and U subject to this coverage uh, requirement. And the solution for this optimization problem is, is very easy. So the solution is just to choose the interval to be the highest density interval of the inverse coupling variable, namely C inverse. And to give you a sense about you know, uh, what is the, you know, the distribution, so the, the distribution of this uh, inverse you know, coupling variable look like, I'm plotting uh, that distribution using this black curve. And this uh, horizontal line here represents the highest density uh, interval for that distribution, which, which determines in op you know, optimal way our confidence interval. And for comparison, uh, on the, red, uh, the red curve is uh, plotting the same thing for the suboptimal estimator using only the open to close returns. And you know, this uh, horizontal line, the red line, is the highest density interval for that uh, distribution. The fact that you know, the black curve is more concentrated highlights the, the efficiency gain by using the candlestick. And OK, so we can do a similar comparison between candlestick-based estimator with a range-based estimator. So in this case, you know, the two distribution looks much similar. But nevertheless, uh, the candlestick-based distribution is still sharper and you know, meaning that we still have some non-trivial uh, efficiency gain uh, by using the whole candlestick in an optimal way. Okay, so in the paper, you know, we present uh, we have tables that tabulates the, the critical value, uh, so which can be used in practice uh, in practice uh, in a simple way. So we have some simulation um, 
basically in the simulation, we just care, you know, this is the model. In the simulation, we want to answer two questions. Uh, one is how large is the efficiency gain with, by using the candlestick-based estimator with respect uh, relative to a uh, standard return-based estimator. The second question that we ask is whether the, the inference, namely the confidence interval, is providing a reliable inference. So to answer the first question, we are going to measure efficiency using the VIS of uh, the 90% confidence interval. And for the second question, we are just going to examine the finite sample coverage rate of the proposed confidence interval and try to see whether the coverage rate is close to the nominal level. So we consider two settings. Uh, to uh, consider two settings. In the first setting, we just consider the estimator based on a single, you know, ten-minute candlestick. So we have one big fat candle candlestick to construct our estimator. In the second case, we consider, you know, uh, aver uh, average version. So by averaging ten one-minute candlesticks. So in each case, the you know, the estimation window is 10 minutes, but in the first case, we have one observation. In the second case, we are averaging 10 ob observations. And to answer these two questions, uh, the first question, the efficiency question. So for this setting, the efficiency gain is seven times. And for the coverage, so our final sample coverage for the, you know, the, uh, the confidence interval is very close to the 90% nominal level. So for the second setting, uh, you know, the efficiency gain for, you know, to answer Q1 uh, is still non-trivial. The efficiency gain is three times and uh, the, the coverage is again, very close to the nominal level. And this is the actual table that allows me in the paper that allows me to draw these conclusions, but you are, you know, the more, de more details are in the paper. So in the remaining, I can maybe five minutes, let me briefly uh, talk about the empirical application. It's a very simple application. Uh, in fact, it's just a, a case study uh, as a, a proof of concept. So in this case study, we are focusing on a particular day uh, from last year. So we are actively writing this paper. So it's from February 23rd uh, from last year. So just to recall, it's you not know, background for that day. So at that, at that time, we are basically one year into COVID. So we are in an early recovery phase. And importantly, it's sort of the long-term interest rate was rising. So there's a lot of uncertainty about you know, monetary policy at that time. So that is the background. And the reason why we are focusing on that day is because uh, in the morning, uh, Chairman uh, Powell, delivered a semi-annual monetary policy a report to the Congress. And you know, this is interesting because we can actually watch the video from the Senate's uh, website to learn exactly what you know, happened when and who says what. So in this exercise, we, we, we look at you know, uh, five different assets. One is the 10-year yield. So because you know, it's monetary policy related, and you know, in, in a lot of people are focusing on you know the ten-year yield, and you know SPY, a passive ETF, ARK, uh, active ETF, and gold is a gold and you know commodity ETF for gold and the Bitcoin, and you know we are just going to focus on, on you know a ten-minute uh, candlesticks. So uh, this is the the plot for you know the ten-year you know treasury uh, yield. So on the top we have the candlestick charts. Uh, the candlestick chart. Uh, so basically, we, we highlighted you know 9:30 and 6 uh, you know 4 p.m. So that is the trading hour for the regular you know stock market trading hour. We also highlight you know uh, the testimony between 10 and you know 12:30. Uh, uh, this is the the candlestick chart, and this uh, is our you know OK estimator for volatility. Together with the confidence interval at ninety percent, you know, confidence level. So to construct, you know, this plot, basically we are using each of these ten-minute candlesticks uh, to produce a particular estimator for the corresponding uh, volatility. So uh, let's just focus on, you know, uh, what happened, you know, during the testimony. 
So an interesting feature of this estimate is that you know it's to these two spikes, you know, here and there. So if if we watch a video to see you know what you know what happened uh, during the testimony, so for the first spike which happened immediately after you know the beginning of the testimony uh, between you know ten and uh, you know ten o'clock and ten ten. So basically, what happened is you know. Uh, two senators, uh, the chairman of the banking committee and the ranking member, uh, one is a Democratic and the other is a Republican, they were giving, you know, you know conflicting opening uh, statements about, you know, all kinds of policy questions. So one particularly contentious point is the $1.9 trillion stimulus plan to be voted in the Senate. At that time, you know, the plan was not voted in the Senate yet. So obviously they were arguing uh, you know, you know, civil way, but you know, it has a big impact on the on the bond market, as we can see from the the the, the volatility spike uh, during exactly that time. So, and then you know, Paul was talking, and the volatility goes down. And interestingly, there's a second spike here. So, you know, during that time, what happened is that there's the other senate uh, senator, uh, uh, Mike Rounds from you know South Dakota. So he was asking an important question. So whether, uh, which is about whether the Fed is going to extend the supplement leverage ratio uh, exclusion for the banking uh, companies. So which is very important for the bond market. So at that time, you know, Paul was not giving a very clear answer. And it turns out that after one month, that exclusion was uh, terminated. So obviously, you know, that piece of information has some impact on the market as well, uh, which we can see from the big candlestick here, and as, uh, as well as the, the, the heightened um, uh, what it did estimate uh, in our estimator. So we also look at, you know, the, the estimators for, you know, SPY, the ETFs, but using our candlestick basic estimator, again, you know, the estimator looks, you know, reasonable and reasonably precise as well. And we also contrast you know, this estimate with you know, return-based volatility estimators. We know that using absolute return to estimate volatility is a bad, bad idea. And from here, we just see that how bad you know, those estimators can be. So these are based on a single absolute return observation for estimating volatility. So obviously, if we only use a return-based estimator, uh, the, the estimates are crazy, uh, crazily random, and the corresponding you know, confidence interval is also you know, huge. So just by the way, so in you know, a revised paper, we also you know, do a similar plot for range-based estimator. So in which case, uh, we basically are looking at you know, something like this. So it's, the range-based estimator is much more reasonable. So we also look at you know, the estimate for the gold um, ETF and also Bitcoin, and we see a very similar pattern. So now it's about time. Uh, let me just uh, conclude. So hopefully uh, with all this discussion, um, I, have, I have convinced you that hopefully uh, our OK estimator uh, is in fact an OK estimator. So because... Uh, our estimator, you know, it has a sense of optimality. It provides reliable feasible inference and it delivers sensible empirical estimates. So even, even though we are just using one, observa uh, one observation. So obviously uh, they may be, you know, average to do better and, you know, smart people have all kinds of smart ways to improve uh, on this kind of, you know, exercise. And this is very easy to implement as well because it's just a linear combination of two features. And that's all I have. And thank you very much for your attention. All right. Thank you very much for a very interesting, clear, and insightful paper. Uh, now let's turn to Professor Frank Diebel for his insight. Sorry about that glitch. Let's do that again. Okay. So um, thanks so much for a well-delivered 
and insightful talk. I enjoyed it and I enjoyed reading the paper. So um, let me give you some reactions. I put uh, specific requests in some sense in asterisks, as you'll see as we go. Um, the one that's gonna come in just a second is a little bit uh, maybe funny, uh, but it's, it's uh, meant to be serious as well. Uh, and that is, um, oh, <clears throat> and that is, um, I would consider a different title uh, for the paper. Um, you know, when I hear okay, it just means, well, okay. You know, um, a, an A is a great grade, a B is just okay. Uh, so I, I, I think you're kind of doing uh, yourself a, dis, a disservice. At any rate, it's something to think about, um, but let's move on. This made me think a lot about great old literatures and great old journals like the Journal of Business at Chicago in particular. So I thought I'd take 30 seconds and just highlight some things for people who might not know. But the Journal of Business, which is now defunct, uh, fertilized some of the most important literatures that we see today. Um, all of the uh, coincident leading index, coincident co uh, composite leading index, composite coincident index, the kind of stuff we now call now casting uh, was done by people like Victor Zarnowitz and then Sally Nefci in that journal. And now, of course, uh, it's everywhere. Uh, but more on point for today, um, it's the home of a wonderful tradition, um, discovery and then extension of the tradition of range-based volatility estimation. Um, we saw, you know, Parkinson and Gorman and Class uh, referenced uh, for example, um, so you know, here are here are the famous old things. It was it was fun for me to just think back to to those guys because it's a it's a great uh, literature. I love range based uh, sort of stuff. Well, now others have extended, of course, Parkinson and Garmin and Class. Um, this is no secret, and most of this, not all of this literature, but the vast majority of it, again, took place in Journal of Business. Um, like Garmin and Class were high-low uh, close, I guess. Becker's brought in the open and the close, so the whole return in addition to the range. Um, you know, Leslie Rogers and Steve Satchel um, extended things in the 90s. Uh, Yang and Zhang, um, a little bit later, around 2000. None of the things that I just mentioned are actually cited in the paper, and I couldn't tell why. Um, I couldn't tell if there's if the authors think there's some mistakes so it was just more convenient and effective not to, to cite them or if the authors felt that well they're doing stuff's related that's related but it's a, really a little bit off point so we won't go into that but as soon as somebody looks at the paper who knows the range-based literature that's the first thing you think about you know where's Beckers where's Rogers and Satchel where's Yang and Zhang and, and several others as well so I'd, I'd really like to see some some discussion of that. And here, for example, uh, is an equation. I, I wrote this in a stylized way. It's actually a little bit more complicated in reality. But for purposes of this discussion, both people like Garmin and Class and later people like Yang and Tsang and many others were working with linear combinations of functions sometimes. Uh, but let's just say linear combinations of open, close, high, and low. Um, this, for example, is right at, is the optimal in the sense of minimum variance unbiased estimator derived in Yang and Zhang. Um, notice um, the big positive weight on the high-low range, the negative uh, coefficient here, some of which was, was emphasized in the presentation. Um, in LWZ, the, per, the present paper, of course, it's, it's a little more stylized. We just bring in the, the range and then the absolute return, which is very nice, by the way. I mean, you know, we could think about just general functions of high-low, open, and close. But, you know, this is really quite tidy. You, you might want the return or the absolute return, of course, we're talking about volatility and, and, and the range. Uh, so maybe that's restrictive. Maybe it isn't, though. I'm not going to worry about that. But, but you know, there's, there's similar equations uh, with similar kind of weightings um, in a lot of the papers that are not cited in this paper. So, so again, I'd really like to, to know more about um, those sorts of links. Now, I want to do a little bit of uh, preaching now, just to, to fill in 
you know, for those who might not be working on range-based volatility estimation, some, some cool things and, and tell you why I really like the range a lot. So there's kind of a hierarchy. Uh, if you think about volatility proxies, maybe you come at this through the realized vol literature, let's say, maybe you come at it from somewhere else, but there's kind of a hierarchy, not kind of, there's a definite hierarchy um, in terms of efficiency of volatility proxies. The worst, let, let's think of like daily stuff, daily volatility, just call it daily, whatever it is. The worst is the daily squared return. A little bit better is the daily absolute return. A lot better, as Gia emphasized in certain ways, are various things that bring in the range, uh, like just the range, going back to the earliest days, or bringing in the close, high-low close, or as he does, or they do, a uh, high-low open close. And then, of course, uh, you know, the optimal everything is, is kind of large K realized volatility going to that asymptotic limit, uh, but you may or may not be able to get there. You might not have the data, there might be microstructure noise that you're worried about, et cetera. So the range based things are kind of in a sweet place. They're way better than the standard volatility proxies, um, yet um, easy to do. Now let me say a bit more about, well, let me, before I tell you why, why they're easy to do and so on, let me look at some pictures to show you what's going on with the range, okay? Here's, here's the someday, notice this day. The log price starts at 10, it ends at 10. So the return is zero. So therefore the squared return is zero and the absolute return is zero. You would say that volatility was zero on this day. Of course, that's, that's ridiculous, okay? So purely return-based things uh, are subject to that issue. And it's not just about zero returns. Here's a day where the log price started at 10 and ended at 12, but look at the gray day obviously much, much less volatile compared to the blue day, which is very, very highly volatile. Nevertheless, each, each of these, each of the blue and gray assets had a return, um, you know, two uh, on that day and, and hence identical volatilities if you just go with squared or absolute returns. Um, what does the range do? See, here, here's those same series, okay, but I've now just drawn in the range. Well, the blue thing is a range of, of 10, right? It's, it goes from five, up to 15, there's its min, there's its max. The gray path has a, has a range of just, you know, whatever, two. Um, you know, so what's the range doing? Um, it, to get the range, you need the whole sample path. So it's bringing in all the information from the whole sample path. It's not, well, not all, it's not a sufficient statistic for the sample path, but if you're interested in volatility, what are the two key pieces of the continuous sample path that, that you'd want? Well, the max and the min. Um, and 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 so so there it is right there. It doesn't get tricked as easily as just a daily return or a daily or a square return or a daily absolute return. It can be tricked. Okay, here here's two sample paths that actually have the same range. Okay, and you see the gray one is generally much less volatile, but it happens to take a dip at the end and then go up here. So its range is actually from five to fifteen, just like the blue range. But the blue, of course, is varying throughout the day not just at that one time. So the integrated volatility, if you did, if you went all the way to that limit, would pick up the fact that the blue is much more volatile because it would be integrating over the whole day, even though the blue and gray days just have the same range here. So, so the range isn't foolproof, uh, but it brings in a lot of the right information in a very simple way. So it's almost effortless, yet highly efficient. Uh, that's, that's what I've emphasized so far. Another big thing, uh, not widely appreciated, although it is known, is that it's robust uh, to microstructure noise, or at least mid S bounds, you know, the kind of ultimate stylized microstructure noise. Why? Because, you know, the max, of course, is likely, the daily max, let's call it, is likely to occur at the S, the min is likely to occur at the bid. So the S is going to be up by half the spread, the, the min is going to be too low by half the spread, so the range is going to be off by the spread. The, let's say the average spread, but the average spread is negligible in the sorts of deep markets where things like realized volatility are typically implemented and so on. So, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of potential appeal of the range in terms of robustness to microstructure uh, noise. And last and not at all least, not at all least, the range is available not only in modern times in terms of like 10 minute ranges and five minute ranges like you can get off Bloomberg as Gia said, but going back to you know 1850 and all sorts of newspapers for, for, for major equities and so on. And this is really important because if you think about what we're trying to do in finance or just asset pricing in general, right? Um, you know, the equity premium, think of it that way. 
what it's ultimately all about is recession risk, you know, uh, business expected future business conditions. And, you know, so the right way of counting sample sizes in that kind of an environment is how many recessions do we have? Okay. And even post World War II or so, you know, there's only whatever, eight or 10 uh, recessions. So, so you really want to go back historically uh, if you want to think about um, expected business conditions and their impact on things like equity premium. And the range lets you do that in an effortless, efficiently, and somewhat microstructure noise free. Uh, kind of a way. Uh, so it, when you put all that together, um, you know, that's a big deal. It has a lot going for it. Um, one thing, uh, let me mention, all right, I'm going to show you on the next page a little taxonomy of how this literature fits together. This will be sort of part of it. But everybody knows the large K realized vol literature and its convergence to integrated vol, so no need to say anything more about that. Um, there's another thing, though, Doing like daily, um, you know, realized ball, well, maybe we're adding up squared, you know, five minute returns, right? Well, each one of those five minute returns is just, is a really terrible, <laughs> five minute squared returns is a really terrible estimate of the volatility inside that's, that five minute interval, because it's just sampling once per five minute interval, right? So you could just do the range there. So whenever you're going to do realized ball, instead of adding up high frequency squared returns, you might want to add up high frequency. Uh, ranges. And that's what uh, Christensen and Podolsky did in a paper some time ago. So they're still large K, but they're moving from, from summing, you know, squared returns to summing um, ranges, getting, you know, getting all the extra um, benefit you get uh, from moving to the range. Now you might say if you have high enough frequency data, your realized vol is basically going to nail it. And maybe a Christensen Podolsky scheme would be even better but who really cares? You know, you're already you're already doing fine. You know, so that so that's maybe an issue. But at any rate, um, Christian and Podolsky, I think, were on to some good things some time ago. So um, so let me just, given the time constraints, move to this table. Okay. So let's think about large K versus fixed, and and in the fixed K literature, the emphasis, as Gia pointed out, of course, is on small K. In fact, K might just be one. Uh, but maybe you sample twice or three or five times, you know, but but um, but it's on small k. So there's large k versus small k, and then there's your vol proxies. It's something like a squared return, or is it the range? So squared returns, large k, of course, I put my, you know, three of my favorite papers there, like old ancient papers, uh, but uh, this literature has a million papers in it. Everybody knows it, okay? But if we stay large K, but move to the range, that's the Christian Sinpodolsky that I, that I just mentioned. Very nice, just the one paper. Uh, this has a million papers in it, but these other cells just have basically one paper. Uh, so it's very clean. Uh, so, but this is nice. It fills a nice place in this box. It's an important place. Um, and then um, for fixed K, but using squared returns, you get Ballerslev et al. You know, which is, and of course, Gia was a co-author on that paper as well. Um, you know, the perspective there is to say, well, look, I'm just going to take a K of one or two or three, so I can't do any, you know, central limit theorems or, or, or loss of large numbers, but I can still, due to the underlying diffusive nature of the situation, you know, work out, um, you know, inference, which is, which is really quite, quite beautiful. But then you could say, well, look, this whole BLL thing is for situations where K is small, like one or two or three. And you know, summing two or three squared returns is going to get you a pretty lousy estimator. The whole point, and it really traces back to Christensen and Podolsky in a related but different context. The whole point is to say, well, look, why not replace the squared returns with ranges? Um, it's easy to do, and there are going to be massive efficiency gains. And that, of course, is exactly what this paper does and emphasizes. And you could see in Gia's Monte Carlo how large the efficiency gains are. So I think it I think it's very cool. Um, I like this table, and I I really like you know the fact that the present paper fills in this last square. So thank you. All right, thank you so much, uh, Frank. Uh, Jia, would you like to would you like to uh, briefly respond? Uh, yes. So uh, thanks a lot, Frank, for the for all the comments. O obviously, we are missing a lot of references. You know, so glad that you are pointing this out. Uh, definitely, we are going to you know 
you know, cite what is papers and then, you know, discuss more properly uh, what is related uh, literature. And um, so I guess, you know, there are two things I want to say. So one is sort of a, a sufficiency argument. So in the sense that um, how do we want to sort of construct it, the estimator? So, so how much restriction uh, we want to impose on the class of estimators? So underlying this, so once we impose um, linearity uh, on the estimator, um, so there's so one can show in the limiting experiment in which you know the what it did and the price is a scaled Brownian motion. Uh, one can show that um, the size um, of the upper shadow and the re, uh, the real body, the real body, and the lower shadow are sufficient statistics for the volatility estimator. So one can work out so the distribution function and provide this kind of sufficiency argument. Uh, so as I mentioned in the talk, so once we you know consider this particular sense of optimality, namely minimum variance. Um, so uh, we can reduce uh, the, the sufficiency to one more degree by focusing on these two features. That may be a sort of an answer to you know, why we are focusing on this particular uh, class of estimators. And related to your last page, which is, you know, this, the table is very nice. Uh, uh, on the last page, the, the reason why, you know, in this paper and in the previous paper with Tim and uh, Jipong, uh, we are doing, you know, fixed K inference is not because we don't like or, or we cannot derive, you know, large K asymptotics. So the reason is really uh, we are focusing on uh, sort of spot estimation. So we are just focusing on you know, estimating the spot volatility. And in that case, because of the concern for the underlying bias you know, due to the you know, time variation in volatility, sometimes, so for example, just after you know, FOMC announcement, the so volatility can change very fast, which means that we need to take a, very, a relatively short time window to conduct you know, spot estimation. So that is going to force we to you know, use a relatively short estimation window and hence you know, tie our hand on you know, choosing how large uh, the K can be. So this is really a uh, sort of restriction due to our empirical you know, goal for estimating spot volatility instead of being an you know, arbitrary choice. So in that kind of situation, and then we ask, okay, this is restriction nature is giving me. I can only use, for example, 10 observations, uh, so, you know, considering a 10 minute window. So in that case, you know, as a good metrician, how can we still do reliable inference? So the point of this phase K approach is to be closer to the final sample distribution of these estimators and hence get, you know, give us more reliable uh, inference, namely the coverage probability of the proposed confidence interval are going to be uh, closer. Uh, ex I mean, oh, very close actually uh, to the normal level. So that is the, the point. So, so in looking into the future research, I, I completely agree with you that, so when we consider you know, using the candlesticks or range uh, as a special case to go back to the literature on estimating you know, integrated volatility functionals. So for example, it integrated variance. So you know, we have done previous, uh, previously, I mean, Dachong and I also, uh, we have done work on you know, how to think about semi-parametric efficient estimator of you know, integrated volatility functionals. So with that in mind, you know, using the candlestick to build a sharper spot volatility estimator may help you know, uh, get a better, you know, more efficient estimator for general integrated volatility functionals. So I'm not saying that is not a, a, you know, important question. It's a very important question. It's just the first step to do that is to understand uh, as, the, as complete as possible, uh, how can we estimate spot volatility in an efficient way? And then we can go there. So this is really just a first step. All right, all right. In the interest of time, uh, we, we, we unfortunately have to close this session um, and there will be questions and we'll postpone these questions to the, uh, to the after uh, the webinar discussion. So uh, let's thank uh, Frank and uh, Jolly again for the excellent, excellent talk and discussion this morning. All right, 
So now uh, let me make a quick announcement for the next webinar. Uh, it's gonna be delivered by Toby Moskowitz on trading cost uh, in less than three, uh, in less than a month. All right, so we'll, post on, we'll postpone all the questions to the, uh, to the, to the uh, post webinar now. Thank you very, very much for, all, for everyone attending this morning's session.